Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm David Feldman. I'd like to welcome you all to this lecture um, uh, this evening at the Birkbeck Institute for the Study of Antisemitism. Um, I'm David Feldman, the uh, our director of the Institute. It's a great pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker uh, this evening, not only because this lecture has already been uh, delayed and postponed once, but because um, I'm truly thrilled to have him speak at the Institute. Kenneth Moss is the Harriet and Ulrich E. Meyer Professor of Jewish History at the University of Chicago. He's recently moved there from Johns Hopkins University. His publications include an unchosen, um, his publications include Jewish Renaissance in the Russian Revolution, which was published in 2009 and which received the Sami Ruhr Prize for Jewish Literature. Um, and most recently, he's the author of An Unchosen People, Jewish Political Reckoning in Interwar Poland, which was published by Harvard last year in, in, in 2021. It's, um, he's a historian of modern Jewish politics, culture and thought. And it's also worth saying that he um, served as co-editor of the premier journal in the field, uh, Jewish Social Studies between 2014 and 2020. One other distinction that he has is that he has more, syllable, more syllables in his lecture title than anyone who has spoken at the Institute since its founding in 2010. So it's with a, it's with a, a deep breath and great pleasure that I introduce Kenneth Moss, who will speak on Nationalism's Pathologies, Diaspora's Fragility, Zionism's Promises, Polish Jewish Thought and Choice in the 1930s. Ken, it's all yours. Um, uh, thank you, David. I, it was on my understanding that I was going to be paid by the syllable, but perhaps we can discuss this you know, afterwards. Um, I, in all seriousness, I want to thank you, David, for extending this invitation. I want to thank uh, Tanisha Westcar and Jen Davison uh, for uh, making this possible. And, uh, and to all at uh, BISA who helped put this together. Uh, and thanks to all of you in the audience for, um, for uh, being here um, in, in what is your evening and I look forward to your, your questions and thoughts. Um, I begin with a quote, uh, even Trotsky has begun to believe that Hitler will remain in power some 10 to 20 years. That which has happened in Germany with its relatively small Jewish community is only a hint of the catastrophe that will break out in those lands where Jews make up a population of millions. By the time the storms finally grow still, the Jewish people will be crushed and broken." End quote. This dark vision of the future that awaited Poland's three million Jews and their nearly two million co-religionists in Romania, Lithuania, Latvia, Hungary, was not voiced in 1939 as German forces massed at the border, but in October, 1933, the essay was published in one of Poland's few politically independent Yiddish journals by a Jewish university student calling himself Michal Oster. And Oster added to this grim vision a harsh message to his fellow Polish Jews. None of the political ideologies or tools that Polish Jews might be banking on to help them was likely to avail them of anything much. To those who urged Polish Jews to, quote, carry on the old politics, end quote, of fighting for Jewish well being in Poland's parliament municipalities and streets, Astor scoffed. It was delusion to think that any variety of political effort by 10% of Poland's population could have much effect on how Poland or Europe would answer the Jewish question. Hopes for protection by the international community merited only, quote, a bitter smile at the naive ideas of the Jewish liberals who believed that the world is becoming more humanitarian, end quote. Was the answer then revolution? Oster himself was a committed socialist, but he saw the approach of the two dominant forces in Polish Jewish life, Polish Jewish socialism, excuse me, the Jewish labor bund and the communists, an approach of unbudging class cult struggle politics 
as akin to telling Jews to, quote, wait with our hands in our pockets until the social revolution comes, end quote. The lesson to be drawn from the terrible ease with which Nazism had just won power in a country with a robust constitutional order and a powerful left was that radical right ideas were winning and would likely hold power long enough to do terrible harm. And Oster drew the consequences of his judgments thus, quote, if we take as given that we cannot hope for an improvement in Jewish life in the diaspora, we must seek another path. Astor's grim extrapolations about Jewish prospects and his lacerating skepticism about Jewish political capacities stand in profound tension with two images that dominate our histories of interwar Polish-Jewish political culture. The first image, prominent in recent Polish historiography, frames the period up to 1936 as one of expanding horizons for Jewish integration in Poland. After all, between 1926 and 1935, Poland was under the rule of the semi-authoritarian but moderate Pilsudski regime, which formally at least rejected anti-Semitism and fitfully pursued a politics of inclusion toward Poland's minorities. Second, Astor's sense of Jews' essential political powerlessness contrasts sharply with a second image much cherished in my own field of Jewish studies, that Polish Jews, though divided ideologically, were united culturally by a vitalizing belief in their capacity to substantially shape their future if they but chose the right form of collective action. As my fellow historians of interwar Polish Jewry know, of course, grim visions of Jewish futurelessness in Eastern Europe, like Astor's, were hardly rare. Even as Pilsudski's regime stretched a thin membrane of semi-authoritarian quiet over Poland's divided polity, and even as Jewish Polonization quickened, Growing numbers of Jews of all varieties were driven toward the view that Jewish prospects in Poland and Europe generally were rapidly darkening. Already in January 1931, after a year-long investigation of Polish Jewish life, the sociologist Jankow Leszczynski, who at the time stood close to the diaspora's socialist Bund, concluded that Polish Jews across all divides had been seized by what he called a pogrom mood and panic mood, and their main question had become, quote, to where should one emigrate, end quote. So what claim should all of these astrotypes have on our histories of Polish and East European Jewry? Should we hail them as prophets, dismiss them as pessimists? What I came to see in my own research into the Polish Jewish 1930s, and what first began to convince me that there was a history here that deserved to be told, was that among the astors of Poland, many were anything but unreflective pessimists. They were rather, no less than we are, thinking people trying urgently to gain analytical traction on what was going on around them. In late 1933, Miriam Shlemowitz, later Shalev, an emissary from Jewish Palestine's kibbutz movement, began to traverse Southern Poland to help the Hechalutz movement, the pioneer movement, get a handle on the influx of tens of thousands of young Polish Jews into Zionist youth organizations. What she found in small towns in the Rovna region both upset and impressed her. She was upset to find that the young people flowing into these Zionist organizations were not true believers. They were often indifferent to core Zionist ideals about Hebrew, about labor, about the new Jew and so forth. But she was impressed by the intellectual intensity and wide ranging reading with which these young people quote, sought an answer for their many questions end quote questions bearing on both Poland and Palestine, questions about the nature of nationalism, the sources of ethnic strife, and, quote, the source of anti-Semitism, end quote. Shlomovitz's report is one of many sources that taken together point to a quiet revolution in the character of Polish Jewish political thinking at the grassroots. As the 1920s gave way to the 1930s, a significant number of Polish Jews moved simultaneously toward profound skepticism about all the old ideologies that had seemed to offer keys to Jewish life in nationalist Eastern Europe, and also moved toward trying to understand the processes taking shape around them in analytical terms, toward seeking reliable sources of information and trying to ascertain soberly what, if anything, they as individuals could really do to change their own situation. Part of the book I've just now published on the basis of this research and on chosen people consists in elaborating the social history of this uninstitutionalized but widespread transformation in Jewish political outlook. 
What I want today to foreground is a second central concern of my work, more in the domain of intellectual history, the history of culture, and in a somewhat paradoxical sense, political history. In particular, I want to anatomize for you some new species of Jewish analysis and cultural and political endeavor that began to crystallize at the fraught intersection of two dawning recognitions. First, that there was ever more reason to fear that Europe's political tra trajectory presented grave dangers to Jews. And second, that contrary to grand hopes that had begun to emerge in the 1890s, and perhaps even in the 1860s, Jews themselves actually might possess quite limited capacity to shape their own collective political fate. Now, before I turn to this dimension of the argument in earnest, one bit of context has to be sketched. Perhaps you are asking why growing numbers of Polish Jews were growing so worried about their political future, even in the relatively stable Piłsudski years. Here, I must risk controversy and hazard some claims about the trajectories of the Kwestia Zhidowska, the Jewish problem in interwar Polish political culture. The Senatsi regime under Piłsudski did generally offer an inclusive vision of Polishness, but already by the end of the 1920s, there was growing reason to doubt that the regime had the will or the power to impose a tolerant answer to Poland's longstanding and festering Jewish question. And it was also growing clear that the question was indeed festering in widening swaths of society. It was not just that Poland's mainstream nationalist right, the Senatsia's main opposition, had by the end of the 1920s wholly embraced a vision of Jews as a grave and malign threat to Polish national well being, and was working assiduously to spread this view at multiple levels of Polish society. Of course, attitudes in Polish society toward the country's large Jewish minority remain deeply divided. But increasingly, there were also unignorable signs that the image of Jews as a grave problem for Poland was finding traction well beyond the organized right. In 1931, the young scholars Alexander Hertz of Wutsiakipova investigated the political attitudes of 500 rank and file members of Poland's Border Protection Corps. Run by the Interior Ministry, the Corps was supposed to be a bastion of the Senatsia's inclusive vision. But Hertz and Kapova, both themselves fervent Nazi supporters, discovered to their horror that, quote, the large majority of our students actually show profound and sincere investment in anti-minority views, and were particularly convinced of the Shkodwivosh Zhidov, the harmfulness of the Jews. Nor was the regime, despite its politics of toleration, insulated from this popular sentiment. In early 1934, the circumspect head of the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee in Warsaw, Yitzhak Gitterman privately reported that anti-Jewish sentiment had become so robust in parts of Polish society that the Senatsia had to accede to it for, quote, any minister who treated the Jews fairly would cease to be minister, end quote. Then too, starting in January 1933, Polish Jews merely had to look across the border to Germany and soon to Austria to see how quickly a politics of enmity toward Jews could win power even in countries with stronger liberal and socialist movements than Poland had. Now here, let me be clear. I am not making a claim about the unanswerable question, where would the Polish situation have gone and the Polish Jewish situation have gone had not the Holocaust transpired. I am simply saying that there were substantial reasons for Polish Jews to worry about their place in Poland's future well before Piłsudski's death in 1935. The kind and degree of danger was a key question for some of the historical actors living at the time, and therefore it should be one for us. And if one agreed with Astor that Jews had little power to do much to avert whatever danger was coming, the question of what to do grew more decisive still. And this leads again to a specific point about the actors to whom I'll now return. One starting point for all of those I'll focus on was the premise that Jews had in fact quite limited capacities to affect the larger political circumstances that would determine their fate. This view put the figures who will populate the rest of my talk at odds with most of the movements that had dominated and continue to dominate Jewish civic life in Eastern Europe. There were many whose faith in Jewish political agency remained unshakable, like the Bundes leader Henrik Erlich, who in 1934 wrote a pamphlet precisely to deny that the easy victories of the right in Germany and Austria bore any implications for the Bund strategy in Poland. But I want to focus today on figures who were ready 
to wrestle with their most fervently held hopes and convictions in the face of disturbing developments. The Vilna Yiddish philologist turned sociologist Max Weinreich is a case in point. Weinreich had been a fervent Bundist from his university days, but by the early 1930s, he had quietly come to believe that no form of Jewish political mobilization could have much effect on Poland's trajectory. Instead, he turned his hopes to communal self-help, and in particular, to the psychic work of shoring up Jewish subjectivity itself. In 1932, Weinreich began to gather a large corpus of autobiographies written by Jewish youth across all swaths of Polish Jewish society. Weinreich was devastated to find across the autobiographies the same thing that his colleague Jankiew Leszczynski had seen in 1930, that numerous Polish Jews from every background had indeed come to believe that their Jewishness would deny them any chance at a decent future. As a social scientist, Weinreich was moved by this toward new sorts of diagnostic thinking about what effects such an outlook was having on the Polish Jewish self. He gingerly and reluctantly began to theorize the possibility that Polish Jews were vectoring on a form of immiserated mutishkeit, minorityhood, which he associated in fraught fashion with the African-American experience and which he saw as emerging when a stigmatized community stopped being able to believe in its own compensatory narratives of its own self-worth. But Weinreich remained a fiercely committed diasporist and diagnosis ultimately had to take a backseat to intervention. He argued furiously that this growing sense of quote, not feeling at home in our home, end quote, was itself a dangerous pathology because it undermined the Jewish will to struggle for a future in Poland precisely when this struggle was most needed. Weinreich demanded that his generation find the secret that would allow Polish Jews to mobilize their energies toward defending East European Jewish life. Weinreich himself, father to two adolescent sons in the 1930s, sought to put this view into practice by founding a Vilna region diasporous Jewish youth organization called BIN, which focused to sought to reorient Jewish young people toward manual labor and a habitus of self-help in the face of what was likely to be a grim state of siege. Others shared this preoccupation with ways to shore up the wounded Jewish subject, even in circles of committed Jewish socialists, circles whose dialectical faith generally armored them against doubt, for after all, rising reaction could paradoxically prove that revolution was imminent. Even in these circles, we can see a growing concern with countering despair. Writers for the Yiddishist youth journal Der Haver, like the pro-communist pedagogue Helena Hatzkels, clearly felt that they had to address head on the growing litany of rightist victories from China to Vienna to Ethiopia. Their readers were undoubtedly hearing about these victories elsewhere. The pieces that Hotskills wrote for Yiddish speaking young people about global political disaster were relatively unflinching, but also always carefully tended the flame of continued faith in the masses and in revolution. But what about those who thought that the future becoming present might be considerably worse for Jews than mere social hostility, economic woe, and associated psychic suffering. Some may wish to dismiss this very question as teleological, but that won't do, because there were plenty of contemporaries who did ask it urgently and began to investigate the disturbing political phenomena around them with new eyes and new tools. The older default outlook of the Jewish ethnic intelligentsia, or at any rate, its progressive wing, which dominated both the diasporist and socialist Zionist lobes, was broadly speaking historical materialist in its assumptions about the relationship of politics and culture to economics, about the slow conjunctural character of social change in capitalist societies, and about the essential rationality of interests, even opposing interests. But in the early 1930s, we find three new lines of analysis that tried to move beyond this Marxian grammar. First, some turned to psychological theory to wrestle with whether political enmities like anti-Semitism might be determinants of culture rather than masks for interest. By 1932, the diasporous pedagogical theorist Avram Golem, unhappily immersed in a project on the psychology of hatred, was wrestling with a grim sense that modernity had greatly increased the human capacity to hate abstractions, like whole groups of people, that such hate was absorbed at a largely precognitive level, and that this was the case with anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe. Piquantly, he compared the absorption of anti-Jewish hostility in the home and school with the ways that, quote, in America, dogs used to be trained to feel hatred toward black people, 
end quote. As some analysts took the psychological turn, others groped toward what we might call political anthropology. In a 1932 essay in Miesięcznik Zidowski, the Zionist analyst Ludwig Oberlander argued that the question of anti-Semitism in Poland had to be theorized in relationship to nationalism's general phenomenology. What he called militant nationalism's drive to, quote, create unity and unanimity in the nation compelled its, its proponents to attack the critical faculty itself and to seek mythologies that could produce pre-rational unities in the nation. In this context, right-wing nationalism's turn to anti-Semitism in Poland and across Europe was somewhat accidental because presumptions of Jewish malignity were already commonsensical and deep-rooted for many in Christian societies. Anti-Jewish mythology was a kind of lowest common denominator myth, but contingency was no real consolation. Oberlander predicted that this nationalist cultural assault would succeed in attracting growing swaths of Polish society well before integral nationalism collapsed under the weight of its empty myths and promises. There was on the whole much less readiness to think about pathologies of nationalist political culture in competing diaspora circles, but a few diaspora socialist intellectuals began to redirect their materialist instincts toward new structural theories about what a changing relationship between state, nation, and democratization might mean for East European Jews. As early as 1928, the then diasporist activist Avram Rosen argued that it was no accident that all the new states in Eastern Europe were converging on an economic politics aimed at driving Jews out of the middle class, regardless of the attitudes of individual policymakers. More important than any subjective hostility toward Jews was the interaction of economic underdevelopment with a shift toward populist understandings of the obligations of the state to society. Especially in eras of economic desperation, democratization combined with the logic of nationhood, combined with new kinds of expectations of the state, would inevitably devolve into demands that the regime serve the real nation over some parasitic minority. Even a non-anti-Semitic regime like the Senatia would be made captive to a public growing ever more fearful and nationalist. Another erstwhile diaspora, the aforementioned sociologist, sociologist Leszczynski, converged on the same sense that extrusion of urban middleman minorities was built into the nature of a state founded on service to the demos. Leszczynski shared Weinreich's view that Jewish communal despair was a destructive pathology, but his growing uncertainty that Polish Jewry would face grave danger in the coming years intersected with his sense that Polish Jews could do little to avert this future or even shape its contours to produce a deep instability in his own judgment about where political reason was to be found. Perhaps in their sense of futurelessness, he started to think, ordinary Polish Jews were actually being more rational than activists like himself still fighting for the East European Jewish future. Quote, and do the Jewish masses not feel that with the passing of the current humane generation and with the rise of a new younger generation for whom personal and national egotism, chauvinism and cruelty constitute its fundamental makeup, do the Jewish masses not feel instinctively that with the rise of this new generation, there must come even harder and darker times, end quote. In other words, and here I transition from what we might call the history of social thought to the history of political reason uh, in a sort of dispersed history. In other words, insofar as one labored under the weight of a sense that harder and darker times were coming, the Weinreichian response of turning toward communal self-help could seem like little more than, as Astor had put it, waiting with one's hands in one's pockets. Perhaps political rationality meant something harsher, some form of triage. In the rawest sense, perhaps meant giving up on fighting for a Jewish future in Europe and trying to get out as an individual. This was a view toward which many Polish Jews were moving in this period. And for many of these, a series of factors fixed their attention on one possible alternative above all, on Palestine. In 1932, Britain, for its own reasons, opened up Palestine to unprecedented Jewish immigration. And the explosive growth of Palestine's Jewish community from 170,000 in 1932 to some 360,000 by 1936 provoked a sea change in Polish-Jewish relations, not so much to Zionism as an idea, as to the Yeshuv, the Jewish community in Palestine, as a fact. Hundreds of thousands of Polish Jews 
engage seriously for the first time with the possibility that the Zionist experiment might play a decisive role in their own future. And questions of judgment and indeed ethics also moved to the fore of Jewish political thought as it wrestled with questions of risk and triage. What was the value of one's culture and identity as against other kinds of goods? What did the individual owe the community and vice versa? And under what circumstances could one rightly collect? Now, lest you think that this account of a bifurcation in Jewish political reason was a purely intra-intelligentsia discourse, let me introduce another voice from the grassroots, that of a 20-year-old from the small town of Bielsk calling himself Benjamin Reich. Benjamin read Weinreich's re research on Polish Jewish youth attentively, and he actually sent Weinreich his own 40-page response. Uh, it's a uniquely rich source on Jewish political thinking at the grassroots, and it's also a counter-argument. It was a counter-argument to Weinreich's stubborn diasporist insistence that Polish Jews could realistically hope for a decent future in place and that individual exotism was irrational. Now, Benjamin himself was almost a diasporist. After a youthful flirtation with romantic Zionism, by the late 1920s, he had come to reject Hebraist ideas about a Jewish cultural reinvention as irrelevant to Jewish needs, and he'd become a devoted consumer of Yiddish secular culture. He'd also become a socialist. Amongst his many interlocutors, he respected the socialist diasporist youth as the most idealistic and the most informed. But sometime in 1934, the Newman nevertheless joined the Zionist youth pioneer movement, Hechalutz, quite openly, as he admitted, to try to get one of the coveted certificates to Palestine that allowed immigration to penniless people, and that Hechalutz could dispense to a non-negligible percentage of its members, albeit only a minority. And in this context, to Weinreich's charge that the Jewish youth's turn to Palestine was irrational, but Newman offered a multi-layered dissent. Based on wide reading as well as direct experience, he elaborated an extrapolative argument about the trajectories of Poland and Europe, not so different from the one argued by the intellectual Janka Wyszynski. Anti-Jewish sentiment was spreading beyond right-wing circles to infect the peasants he encountered as a village tutor and even Polish workers, though Jewish socialists like his friends were loath to admit it. Quote, one talks about the Nara, the right-wing youth, but one means the workers, end quote. But Newman dismissed hopes that all this was a flash in the pan due to the depression. Quote, we Jews began to feel a specific national oppression even before the economic crisis, end quote. And right-wing victories in Germany and Austria drove Ben Yeoman to a further predictive conclusion. However much he and quote 90% of today's Halutzim and also the left Zionists and Bundist leaders would welcome a social revolution, the world had now entered quote, a fascist era, end quote. Here then was a young person out in the sticks reorganizing his account of political reason, both around a chastened sense that Jews had quite limited resources and around a predictive posture that both everyday social experience and global events suggested metastasizing dangers to Jews that had to be taken seriously. And Benjamin's case also shows something else, that a conviction of coming danger opened up possibilities of very different kinds of thinking about what was most rational for Jews to do. For Max Weinreich, national rationality meant trying to use whatever the community had to maximize the good for Polish Jewry as a whole. Benjamin's version shows that once one added in the relative certainty of danger, the fact of limited resources dictated a different political realism. Here was his counter argument to Weinreich's charge that the Palestine option was simply irrational. Quote, it's true that the exit is too narrow and can't meet the needs of millions of Jews. The land of Israel can, however, be a partial solution for the Jewish question and meet the needs of hundreds of thousands. It's clear that only the social revolution can bring the full solution of the Jewish question. But in the meantime, let us use every means of salvation for thousands of Jews, especially given that the land of Israel can solve the Jewish question, at least in part. For the meantime, we don't have anything better than Zionism, end quote. And there was a second aspect of Benjamin's argument, which confronted both diasporist and Zionist ethics, Jewish nationalism's ideals as such, with an assertion of the individual's prerogatives. Weinreich, had mocked the choice of numerous young people to devote all efforts to seeking one of the scant emigration certificates to Palestine in the following terms, quote, a young man whom we have cited put it thus, Zionism calls to the Jewish youth, let he who can save himself. 
But the disproportion between wanting to and being able to leave the diaspora is so obvious that the Jewish youth's turn to Zionism has to be deemed a form of escapism. End quote. The turn to Zionism was irrational, that is, because Zionism could not possibly save most of the community. Ben Yuman's response was that nothing could help most of the community. Palestine was the best option because it was the only one that could even help some, quote, no other medicines will be found, certainly not <clears throat> for the whole Jewish community, end quote. If this era pushed some Polish Jews to new views about the limits and real capacities of Jewish politics and pushed them toward exotism and Zionism of a new sort, it also began to push others, including some who remained in the, in the diasporist camp to new clarity about the limits and capacities of culture. Among the preoccupations visible in diasporist cultural thought by the mid-1930s was a deepening interest in what sorts of aesthetic experience particularly might help the suffering modern Jewish subject bear up in the face of deepening woes. In 1934, readers of the Lvov journal Szegwad Spowetchny could find the Yiddish-Polish poet Deborah Fogel investigating what kind of children's literature might help rescue the contemporary child's subjectivity from an alienating present. Fogel hailed works that in their imagistic richness could help instill in European children what she called the legend of pacifism, leading them to the conviction that they were more, quote, like distant Indians, Negroes, or Arabs than unlike them, end quote. In that same year, the rising star among a cadre of talented young Yiddish poets in Vilna, Chaim Grade, began to try to produce a poetry that would directly counter despair itself. Poetically, Grada's key move to counter his reader's despair turned on an audacious mythicization of natural evolution, of all things. And here I read from Yo, yes, his credo poem of the mid-1930s, quote, a bridge of eons becomes a rainbow thrown from my window to the woods. The animals, my forefathers, with amazed eyes, sniff, caref sniff carefully my newfound form. They caress me with hot teeth and sharp claws, for generations we struggled that you might come to be. For Grada, this revelation that he was not a fallen creature, but the attainment toward which all of nature had been working all along was meant to offer what he himself called a kind of psychic healing for his readers and for the tight knit Yiddishist youth of Vilna whom he knew intimately. His poetry itself signals this outward facing commitment in its careful attention to the practical means by which such a manifestly fictional vouchsafing of human value is to be internalized. He registers in advance that the subject seeking to overcome despair had to will the heart to believe in his terms, this manifestly, manifestly fictional myth to do so repeatedly as a kind of spiritual exercise via aesthetic experience. In this sense, we might see Grada and Fogel both starting down a path of 20th century thought about imagination's powers well captured by Cora Diamond's remarks on Socrates via Martha Nussbaum, that a substantial part of human freedom turns on, quote, the capacity to transform one's situation by the exercise of creative imagination, by rethinking its meaning rather than finding ways out of it. But we also shouldn't miss the painful limit that Grada felt compelled to accept. Grada was a deeply political poet. The poems with which he first made his name in the same period were written in direct reaction to what he called present day world catastrophes within a manifestly socialist worldview about the nature and trajectories of injustice. But Grada resolutely refused to offer his readers any hope that Jews had it in their power to do anything about the catastrophes unfolding around them, except endure. In Grada's poetry, affirmation of the world cannot change the world, which will remain just as catastrophic, quote, in coming days. At best, Poetry can only help transform the subject's relationship to experience. Quote, yes, this means my destiny is my virtue, end quote. For figures like Grada or Fogel, shoring up Jewish subjectivity against what was coming might be the best one could do. For others little different from them in sociological and ideological starting point, like Oster, Leszczynski, or Benjamin Reich, realism meant acknowledging that nothing could be done for the whole community, but that something substantial might be done for a non-negligible minority thereof, a politics of triage. Inevitably, this forced ethical questions to the surface. At the close of his 1935 book, Max Weinreich basically charged those seeking exit with betraying the community. Benjamin Reich responded by asserting the individual's prerogative to seize whatever chance of betterment the world really offered. 
Finally, let us also recognize that this debate was complicated by a third position relating to the question of one's children's future. In early 1933, the Zionist activist Alter Dryanov wrote a searching account of the older generation of small town Zionists he had met in a six month tour of Poland. In particular, he observed that not only had they continued to donate to the Zionist cause, even as the economic bottom fell out, but that they did so knowing that they stood no chance of benefiting directly from it, perhaps only their children, figuratively or at best, literally. They were thus bringers of a burnt offering, a sacrifice from which only others might benefit. Equally striking are diasporist testaments to the spreading readiness of non-Zionist families, both traditionalist and diasporist, to encourage both sons and daughters to invest all their efforts in trying to get to Palestine. In 1934, the Yiddishist educator Gershon Orinsky wrote from the small town of Prujane that it was now common for the parents to urge their children to try for a Palestine certificate. Himself founder of the Yiddishist diaspora school, Orinsky was talking not about Zionist families, but about his own socialist diaspora circles. Here were parents with no connection to Zionism, urging their children to invest all efforts in trying for a new life in a distant land. Here too was a form of triage thought taking shape at a fraught site between communality and particularity and perhaps beyond them. So let me conclude. I have today tried to sketch two broad lines of revisionist argument about Polish Jewish life and thought in the 1930s. First, I've tried to show that at the interstices of a world of Jewish political thought organized around siloed ideological certainties, there was also a rapidly expanding body of Jewish analysis that groped beyond progressive assumptions toward darker insights about the dynamics of nationalism and the nation state, the powers of enmity in politics, and the ways minority populations can be subjected not only to particular kinds of damage, but also particular exigencies of choice. Second, I have explored a recasting of Polish Jewish politics and culture around newly skeptical thought regarding what culture and politics could each actually achieve. The movement of Palestine to the center of Polish Jewish horizons and fraught choice among incommensurable communal, individual and familial needs. All the forms of thought I've been addressing were in one sense, secret sharers. Their starting point was pained renunciation of the hope at the heart of modern Jewish politics since the double birth of Jewish nationalism and socialism in the 1880s, and perhaps since the birth of Jewish liberalism in the mid 19th century, namely that collective Jewish political action could substantially determine Jewish communal fate. What divided the far less hopeful forms of thought I've examined was the question that followed from this conclusion about Jewish incapacity, whether the proper response was to seek new ways of helping the whole community weather the storm, or whether the likely scope of what the community could be subjected to dictated a stance of salvage and triage. In turn, this question of the scope of the danger was something that had to be analyzed, but could not be known. An illustration of Ulrich Beck's comment that risks are quote, both real and unreal, insofar as risk thinking must concatenate quote, damages already real today with projected dangers of the future that can only be acted on now if one hopes to act on them at all. This is in part an argument about a rupture toward, toward new forms of Jewish thought in the 1920s and 1930s, but it also invites us to look backwards throughout Jewish modernity to ask about earlier moments of doubt about Jewish capacities and progressive faiths. I too, like so many of my colleagues, remain interested in Jewish agency, but I'm trying to help chart a way back to a history that takes seriously the shaping power of the Jewish question in Jewish life, a power that was admittedly intermittent, but nevertheless profound and above all, indifferent to what Jews wanted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. That's, um, uh, that was rich, hugely rich and, and fascinating and food for thought, not only for the next half hour, but for, uh, for uh, days and weeks to come. Um, please, it, um, if people do have comments or questions, please raise your virtual hands. Um, or if you don't want to speak yourself, then uh, place your question in the chat. Um, if I could get things started, Ken, 
by in a sense sort of asking you a question about the articulation of, of the two parts of your story. One is the sort of expanding, the expanding body of social thought, and the other are the new forms of Jewish politics and the politics of triage. And as you were talking, it seemed, I wondered whether it's the second of those, which is most distinctively, most distinctively Polish Jewish, these immediate, and that, that, and that there is, uh, which is a way of asking you to what extent these new bodies of Jewish thought were in dialogue with Jewish and non-Jewish thinkers outside of Poland. Mm. Because I can think of other, other contexts where the analysis of the Jewish situation in Europe was going through the same sort of the same sort of the same sort of transformation. Um, uh, Arthur Rupin, for example, who having once been sort of optimistic, then took to an analysis of anti-Semitism as being some sort of primordial drive. Or interestingly, um, the English clergyman, James Parks, who was a pioneer in the analysis or, or, um, or cataloging of anti-Semitism, actually was developing an analysis of um, Jewish, non-Jewish relations in Central and Eastern Europe, which was not unlike the Shinskids. It was really friction in the labor market plus populist politics. So mm -hmm. um, I'd just like to ask you to say something about those wider intellectual connections. Yeah, that, that's terrific. And, and, and of course, you, it's, it's an acute question. And first of all, you're absolutely right that, um, that I, I wouldn't want to suggest that the that the story of social thought that I'm trying to reconstruct here is particularly Polish, and it's it's and and indeed some of the figures I'm talking about were um, were already a kind of they were sort of a near abroad of Polish of, of East European Jewish intellectuals. I mean, Leszczynski, many of them moved back and forth across the Polish Central European and West European borders. Um, some of them had already resettled in the West and were as much part of expatriate and perhaps kind of local um, intellectual circles as they were connected to Polish Jewry. I think the, the one thing I would say that does bind all the intellectuals I talked about together and set them apart within the larger world of progressive, what's called progressive social thought, um, um, and maybe not such progressive social thought, but I'll come back to that in a second, um, was that they were all what I would call part of a, a sort of self-consciously ethnic East European Jewish intelligentsia in the sense that they understood they believe themselves to be called, as it were, to uh, offer um, understanding and guidance to what they themselves defined as a nation. I mean, they were in some sense nationalist intellectuals, although all of the figures I've talked about um, certainly saw themselves as part of a global progressive camp. Um, and I think that that meant that um, it didn't, didn't necessarily inflect their thought. I think in the case of someone like Weinreich, it probably did, and I'll come back to that. But it meant that they um, their fundamental concern was indeed vector on, on helping Polish Jews make sense of their situation, or East European Jews, but of course Polish Jewry was, you know, loomed so much larger for them than the other Jewries of the, of the region, just demographically. Um, the larger question you ask is, is very, very one very close to my heart, and indeed I, I think of these figures who I treat uh, in extension, extenso in the, um, uh, in the fourth chapter of the book, as, as um, sociologically and intellectually very much part of a, of a global progressive intelligentsia. Um, most of them come to their analysis, not all, but most with, with broadly Marxian a sort of just tools, right? A toolbox that tends to direct them toward thinking in sort of 20 year chunks, thinking in terms of, um, you know, as you put it, fr frictions in the labor market, thinking in terms of um, either Marxian or, or Weberian, although I don't think they knew Weber really, uh, terms of, um, uh, you know, class interest that can be reconstructed in fairly reasonable ways. Um, and you know, efforts to close the labor market as at the root of various kinds of cultural closures. But, so they, they, they have that armature of concepts. I think, I think what, what conjoins them with some of the figures you, you point to, um, and we might add to that someone like the young Hannah Arendt in a way, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, is, or for that matter, the old, the aging uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, 
is a um, or two things. One, unlike Rupin, perhaps certainly unlike some figures in this era, particularly associated with the Zionist camp, although not only the figures I look at here and I talked about today briefly, um, do not move toward a kind of um, historiosophical argument that anti-Semitism is just sort of you know a kind of um, a, that it's a quantum that is, you know, that it's inexpungible and is always equally dangerous, nor in fact do they, and this is maybe one, one, one point that's worth bringing out, um, nor do these figures tend to think, A, that anti-Semitism is necessarily the, um, the freestanding causal element that, that needs to be named, identified, and, and charged with sort of being the primary problem, or that it's particular, or that Polish culture, Polish political culture is particularly um, anti-Semitic are susceptible to it. All those ideas could be found in, in some parts of, of um, how people looked at the situation. But all the figures I look at, like Leszczynski, you know, they're very attentive to the divided views of Polish society. Um, they are actually quite loath to think that anti-Semitism is, um, is the thing that needs to be focused on exclusively. They, and they tend to want to understand how some sort of ensemble of, um, of social problems is, is feeding a crisis. I, I think the one way in which they connect to the figures you're talking about and those figures are all set apart from a kind of larger hinterland of progressive thought is the degree to which the figures I studied here and someone's, they self-selected by, by this means, I think, um, for me, the degree to which they are consciously aware or feel it to be true that the tools they have entered the 1930s with analytically are, are inadequate mm -hmm. to the intensity and the tempo of the political problems they're facing. That that I think, and that I would say that doesn't necessarily set them apart as uh, that. Not that's particularly Polish Jewish formation, but I would suggest I, I hope that insofar as this book might speak to the larger history of progressive thought in the 30s. I mean, I think there is a kind of um, a subset of progressive thinkers who, to some degree or another, begin to realize that their their tools are not are are not adequate, and and their search for new tools, very much against a kind of clock. Uh, for these figures is, is part of the drama that I wanted to, to, re to recover. Thank you, Ken. Um, Agnes Corey, you have your hand up. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask ask your question or make a, co a comment? Yes, um, thank you very, very, very much. Um, my doorbell went a couple of times while you were talking, so I apologize if you already tackled the issue which I'm just about to ask. Um, yes, I mean, I know that in Hungary, in already in the 1930s, the period you're talking about, um, the Zionists were dreaming and working towards going to Eretz, Israel. It was a very romantic view. Um, and it sounds like this appears also um, in the literature which you tackling. Now, my question is, are you dealing with distinguished scholars? And does the idea that Eretz Israel may have to be shared with non-Jews, does it come up among your scholars? Because I don't think it has come up in the Hungarian thinking, popular romantic thinking. It was just next year in Jerusalem and Eretz Israel. And that was long before the Jewish laws and, and in the nine, early 1930s. So yeah, that's my question. That's, that's a terrific question. And, and, um, uh, and also not, not to begin answering a very good question with, a, with crude self-promotion, but I will say that the book, uh, there's a dimension of the book that's much more sort of squarely focused on um, on where the phenomena I've laid out fit in, in the history of Polish Zionism, and I think and and um, and tries to, and speaks to some degree to this question. I mean, your 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 I think your your point is well taken. I don't know that much about the Hungarian Zionist scene. Certainly, and, and actually, someone in the comments asked about where Beitar is and all this. We might take a, a let me take several steps back and sort of answer several nested questions that emerged from your question. First of all, I don't mean to suggest, in general, before, even before we turn to the question of Jews and Palestinians. I don't mean to suggest that uh, all Polish Jewish uh, engagement with Zionism had this kind of sober, uh, unromantic, um, kind of post or non-ideological mode. There were, of course, plenty of 
um, Zionist true believers of all sorts in Poland. Um, and, um, and of course, it's also true that coming to the movement for whatever reason, there were those who came to the movement for, for sort of very practical reasons and yet were drawn in to some of the, the many visions of some sort of grand transformation that Zionism would afford. Um, so, so all the variants of Zionist ideology, which means also so too, all the variants of thought and perhaps unthought or limits to that thought about um, what was to come of Jewish-Palestinian relations or of the Palestinian people in the case of Zionism's accomplishment, um, all, those, all those were available and were, and were discussed to some degree. Now, to, to turn more specifically to your question, um, the sources that I engage, which are sources very that, that excavate um, the kinds of searching questions that that um, people coming to Zionism for largely practical reasons asked, those sources do suggest substantial awareness uh, of of um, of real conflict of the of the conflict and the dimensions of the conflict and the likelihood of further conflict um, between Jews and um, and Palestinians, or certainly between Jewish and Palestinian aspirations. Uh, in in Palestine, to what degree such concerns um, got more than a hearing? I mean, you know, to what degree they shaped people's choices? I, I think, and here, you know, it's a little bit of a tricky business to to figure that out because I, I didn't do the kind of work that would let me say trace what Palestinian poli what, what the politics vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian and Zionist questions. What, what sort of politics the people who actually made it in the circles I'm looking at to Palestine brought with them. Um, I suspect that um, that those who came to Zionism out of a very sober account of what was likely to happen in Eastern Europe um, were not necessarily therefore driven in a more um, progressive direction. I know, I know it's not clear to me, but it might very well be that they were driven in a certain sense toward a kind of Beitar Zionism of, you know, um, a kind of power politics idea, a sense of that realism is a kind of, you know, world's an ugly place and, and you've got to carve out what you need for yourself. Um, I'm not sure, but, but then again, it's, there's also some, there's some evidence that the opposite applies, that, you know, that, that um, this did generate, at least in some people, searching inquiry into, um, in, into what it meant to engage in a kind of a nationalist project, a, a project of self of self rescue that was also a nation building project in a way and a colonial project, if you wish, that clearly was going to um, eventuate and had begun to eventuate in some of the same kinds of ethnic conflict um, that I think Jews probably associated primarily with with Polish Ukrainian conflict actually in the Polish borderlands. That was the most the nearest concrete example. Um, and I will end by saying. Max Weinreich, a figure I spoke about um, in the context of his work on Polish Jewish youth, um, wrote a very, an equally interesting text that I investigate in the book, a, a, a travelogue of his first visit to Palestine in late 35. And he himself was, a, was an unromantic anti-Zionist I and mean, he never had a moment of interest in it until the mid thirties. Um, he'd always dismissed it as a kind of ridiculous sort of utopian project. And, you know, kind of, he was a Buddhist and thought it was sort of colonialist to boot, but he just thought, mostly thought it was irrelevant. And I think what's one of the things I find very interesting about his searching travelogue is that he does um, he does think critically against the categories of many of his Zionist interlocutors about the Jewish-Palestinian conflict. He foresees a terrible conflict. He looks for very objective um, measures to think about the, the ways in which to figure that conflict. So he, he, for instance, he suggests that one way to think about this is what happened to the great um, largely noble Baltic German population of Latvia and Estonia after the First World War, which is, as he put it, you know, they built the area with their money and, and, uh, and expertise. Um, but then when the Latvian nationalists, peasants turned nationalists took over, the Baltic Germans got it in the neck. And what's kind of funny about that comparison is for Jewish readers of Weinreich's um, text, I mean, they, they don't, couldn't, they, they are utterly neutral on that conflict. They don't care one way or the other who if it's the Latvian peasants or the Baltic Germans <laughs> who went out in, 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 in the Baltics. Um, so you can see Weinreich looking for very objective ways to think about this problem. But, and here I'll end, he also has come to the conclusion by the mid thirties that um, he can't just dismiss Zionism anymore as a kind of, as a sort of windy and ridiculous utopia because the Yishuv has actually absorbed several hundred thousand Polish Jews and, and, and become the most substantial um, uh, site for Jewish immigration um, of any land in the world. Um, and and he, he sees you know, reason to think that insofar as the Jewish problem in the diaspora remains bad, and he thinks it will, 
um, that capital and people and all sorts of things will continue to flow to Palestine. In that sense, he thinks, you know, as a diaspora nationalist who's concerned for the future of Jews, he can't dismiss the, you know, the, the, the way in which this project, whatever it's foolish or, or problematic claims has, has provided a kind of refuge for, for some of them. So that's an interesting place for him to end, having thought, I think, very carefully and an open-ended fashion about the coming Jewish-Palestinian conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, Ephraim Nissan. You should, un you should unmute yourself, Ephraim. Yes. May I add something to the reply? May I uh, just mention Moshe Flinker, who was born to a family of Polish background in the Netherlands, fled uh, to Belgium and died as a teenager in the Holocaust. While in hiding in Belgium, he requested that a book to learn Arabic would be found for him. Mm. And they found it, but it was in a language that he didn't know. So he asked for another book to uh, learn the intermediate language so that he would learn Arabic so that uh, he would be able to go to Israel, become a politician and be able to talk to our brethren, to the, the, the Arabs. So you see that uh, there is that kind of investment in that situation on the part of a teenager. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and I think there, you know, um, it's interesting, you mentioned Belgium, it reminds me of a different figure. It's a different trajectory, but also interesting, a figure, um, um, Abram Leon, who those of you out there who are, uh, uh, and like enjoy the deep the deep cuts of Trotskyism, <laughs> we'll, we'll know about him. I mean, he's a figure, and this actually comes back to the previous question as well, connects both previous points. Um, he's a figure who I believe came out of the world of um, Hashem Yatsair, a left Zionist um, setting in which both intensities of Zionist self transformation were deeply felt and in which there was constant or intermittent leakage outward to the communist left, you know, because they, they were, because there was a kind of profound tension for many of them, between their visions of of, of Jewish reinvention and their uh, and and the and the sort of their, and their anti-colonial and and often basically you know pro-Soviet sensibilities, um, and uh, you know someone like you can see many of these sorts of thinkers right in the course of the '30s. Maybe it's actually next back to David's question as well. You know who are who who have gone through many moments. They've 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 broken with Zionism. They become critics of it. Uh, in Vinery's case, they were always critics of it, but they're also, but they're also groping for a sense, and that's one of the reasons they look to Trotsky, who articulates this quite early, as I understand from, from my, my friend Tony Michaels, who knows this world better than I do. Um, they, they're groping for new tools, and one of the things they're starting to ask themselves is, you know, what is, what is the status of a Nachtleger like Palestine? Or it might be that they end up sort of Borachovi and Jews are going to get pushed there anyway. So, right, so they have to they reach for these kinds of ideas about um, maybe some sort of uh, uh, coexistence, you know, that's, that's maybe the most idealistic kind of answer that you see in those circles. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Ken, we have a question in the chat from Sue Johnson, which I'm going to pose, but I'm also going to adapt it in a way um, to, to sort of piggyback on it. So Sue asks, how important was Balfour? Had Balfour not endorsed emigration to Palestine, would there have been a movement for emigration to other countries? Um, and of course, that it is raises the question of of whether Jews in Poland were thinking about other countries, other countries in Europe, for example, like France, which was an uh, an immigration country for much of the interwar uh, interwar period. And of course, uh, this is a a point of great distinction between Jewish and non-Jewish Poles because non-Jewish Poles were also, or many of them were also trying to emigrate, but not on the whole to Palestine. So uh, could you, so I suppose just thinking about those questions in the context of your people who were talking about emigration and triage, and you spoke about triage and emigration to Palestine, but was there a sense of other, pla other, other places in the globe that could perform that, uh, that function, or was it really, primarily Palestine oriented? That, that's an, a very important question, and I, but also it also allows me, um, a very, I think a very important clarification, although a complex one. Um, I, I think had, had 
America been had the U.S. been open, mm. um, you know, the Palestine. I mean, I, the masses of these people would have left for for the U.S. I, I and I think it's a tricky business to to simply state that everything was closed, but I think it certainly seemed to most Polish Jews, and I think it seems from most of the scholarship I know that they were basically right that there were actually very few possible destinations. I mean, France there was a complex labor. Um, uh, framework of you know, that you, by, whereby you could get in, but it's, you know, it's not, it's, um, it simply wasn't on the radar of possibility of Polish Jews. Many Polish Jews, as, as this figure, Alexander Gitterman, who I, excuse me, uh, Yitzhak Gitterman, who I mentioned briefly, um, who was the head of the, the Poland's local head for the Joint Distribution Committee. I mean, he noted in a letter from 34 that, that many Jews who wanted to leave were simply too poor for the kind of cost of emigration. And one of the, so, so there's a couple of points to be made here. Um, there, there were very high barriers to migration to most places that Jews could think of. The only exceptions that that flicker up intermittently, or that at least in the things I've seen, are not France, but, but Latin American countries. Um, there is, in the late 20s, a moment of real interest in migration to Argentina. Um, and, and on paper, at least, those doors weren't completely closed by the mid-30s. Um, but uh, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that they were practically very hard to get open for individuals. And it's also the case that the only place that, that you could get to sort of um, as a penniless young person, young Jewish person, not easily because most people didn't, right? But the only place that sort of had a framework to allow that kind of emigration um, for Jews was Palestine because of the, of the certificate system, because of the, forgive me, now someone's at my doorbell, uh, because of the mandate system. Uh, um, and the mandates politics, uh, you know, so, so um, I think in, in answer then to Sue's, it, it, if had it not been for Balfour and for the mandate, obviously Palestine wouldn't have been on anybody's agenda real. I mean, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been a possibility. It was a possibility inter intermittently based on both Jewish outlook, but also British policy through the twenties and thirties. Britain for its own reasons opens the door under Walshop to, or however that's pronounced, uh, you all know better than I do. Um, uh, uh, it opens the door in 32. Had it not opened the door in 32, you know, I think there would have been none of this mass influx of desperate exodists into Zionism because what's what would be the point? Um, but but basically, most I mean, Polish Jews were convinced across the board, and I think they were basically right that most places had very high barriers to possible Jewish immigration. Um, most of the places that would have been the that were the natural trajectories of Jewish mass migration on a huge scale, of course, before the First World War. Um, and, and Palestine in that sense was quite exceptional. Palestine, I mean, certainly, it's certainly a fact that the that for the first time in 1932, and then all the way from 32, 33, 34, 35, to, 30, to early 36, when, when the Great Arab Revolt begins, um, Palestine was for the first time, and the last time until after the Second World War, um, far and away the largest um, migration site of just raw numbers of Jews anywhere in the world of any single country. And that's not because um, Jews weren't interested in leaving for other places. We might add to that, that um, there's plenty of evidence, you know, this is cited in really almost any, anyone's memoirs, you'll see that um, whenever an individual from a small town did figure out how to get to somewhere else, there was, there was absolute um, 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 desperate excitement amongst their neighbors about how they had done it. Um, and this figure I re referenced at the very end, this very interesting figure, Gershon Orinsky from this town of Prusina. Um, you know, Prusina had an incredible outflux that 20% um, of the graduates of the high school at the beginning of the 30s had managed to emigrate from Poland by, um, by 39 or 38 is when they have last source. And that's an incredible number. I mean, it's astonishing, right? Um, and the large majority of those had gone to Palestine. But he notes that somebody had gotten to Cuba and that the town was wanted to know. He notes that two people had gotten to Argentina and the town wanted to know how. Um, somebody got to America. The only way to get to the US was through family reunification, essentially, um, or very complex forms of family sponsorship. Um, and he notes too that in early 34 was this brief moment when Soviet Birobajan, this sort of largely fantastic project of mass Jewish resettlement in, in the far in Soviet Far East, there was a brief moment when there was some real effort by sort of pro-communist circles um, with the encouragement of the Soviet Union to, to advertise it as a real possible destination for non-Soviet Jews. It never really was, but in 34, there was some sense that it might be. And Orinsky and many other sources note 
that there's tremendous excitement around Birbhajan, not in red circles, of which there were red circles, but you know, amongst uh, Michal Oster, this figure I start open with, later claimed, and he seems to know, seems to be right, that um, even you know that sort of poor families with zero connection to the communist project um, were briefly very interested in the possibility of emigration to Birbhajan. So you get this sense that there's this tremendous amount of in interest, high barriers, and and Palestine in that sense, because of mandate policy after 32. And which changes in 36, as we know, um, emerges perhaps somewhat in ex extravagant and exaggerated fashion, but emerges as a very, as the one thing that seems like a real and concrete possibility. And I, I probably, that's where I probably should have begun that discussion because it's that context that, that really renders it so fascinating and strange and, and, and explains the sudden shift of the interest, not of every Polish Jew, but of substantial numbers of Polish Jews who really had zero connection to the Zionist project to begin with, to um, the prospect of, of maybe getting to Palestine, especially if they were younger. Thank you, Ken. We're overrunning, so we just have time for one last question from Sabi Sagal. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Ken, for a, a fascinating uh, presentation. Um, you, you began with a quote from Trotsky. And uh, uh, my question, uh, first part is, um, whether Polish Jews, Polish Jewish leftists were aware of Trotsky's debate with the German uh, social democrats and communists. If, if you remember, Trotsky argued uh, in despair, sitting in exile in Mexico, that the social democrats and the communists in Germany should unite, that they, together they had the power to overthrow the Nazis or to stop the Nazis getting to power, rather. Were there any Jewish, Polish, leftists who were aware of that debate that was happening. Uh, and a corollary of that question is, were there any, was there any serious involvement on the part of Jewish, Polish Jewish socialists uh, to get engaged with the Polish trade union movement, such as it was even under Pilsudski? So the, the answer to the very last part of the question, and you know, I, alas, they're, they're, I'm, my, my knowledge of the real ins and outs of the socialist world is much more limited than that of a number of other scholars who, whom you could ask, like uh, Tony Michaels, Jack Jacobs, others. Um, but the, the answer to the very last part is the Bund was very closely connected to the Polish um, yeah. uh, trade union world uh, and dominant within the within the sort of Jewish side of it without question. Um, and that actually, I'll come back to your question, but just briefly, someone else asked about the Bund. I'll simply say this, that the Bund actually, in a certain sense, and perhaps perhaps one thing that's tragically sort of up to each of us to decide that, um, someone asked about the Bund after the late, in the late 30s. The Bund in the late 30s actually had new kinds of hopes that its strategy was the only sensible strategy because they were the only party that could claim to have any kind of um, real ally in the Polish political scene. They could point to the PPS, the, the rump PPS, the real, the real nationally minded socialist left left over on Pilsudski's left, they could say, at least we have an ally that's fighting the regime uh, and fighting for equality. So, so and, and, the and, they, and in the world, the trade unions, you, know, you, you, had, you had a sense that there, there was still a, a fund of goodwill. So the Bund in some sense, Bundists don't change their minds in the, in, in the, in the, in the, and, and they're disinterested. They don't seem to connect to the world of Trotsky. There are elements in the communist, much smaller Jewish communist world, um, who do who are very aware of, of Trotsky and become Trotskyists. Uh, Jack Jacobs has a, um, a a little useful but small but useful piece about this uh, in Pauline from many years ago, uh, looking at a series of um, memoirs by several of those who survived all of this, who had been communists as young men, uh, had been close to um, you know uh, folks that uh, you know on the on the British end like um, I guess Shimon Abramsky and um, and uh, you know Isaac Deutscher of course, but who but who don't stay Stalinist. Uh, who go who, who go in, um, in a Trotskyist direction. Um, how much they knew about the ins and outs of these debates, I don't know. You can certainly see in socialist writings, I, I mostly spent time with heterodox socialists of various sorts, um, but they're, they're very aware, I mean, and they're, they're deeply terrified and upset by what they see in both Germany and Austria. They're very upset about the, the failure of socialists and communists to do anything about it. And presumably that means they would have liked to see them unite. To what degree they have the same kinds of um, they make the same kind of decisive arguments that Trotsky seems to have made about where all this is going to go and 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 what should be done about it. I don't know. I, I think that um, I think Trotsky looms large for many Jewish um, thinkers in the 30s as as sort of a figure who at least seems to represent the possibility of a of international socialist politics that does take the Jewish question seriously and that knows that something has gone terribly wrong, right? In the prognostically 
and politically. But to what degree that translates into a Trotskyist movement, I think it's very minimal in Poland. And I don't know how real, you know, the, the insightful ruminations of a distant figure seem, I, I don't know to what degree they seem significant alongside real, um, sort of whatever real political options might remain for the individual, if not for the community. But I could be wrong about that. That's probably something that deserves further research. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, not only for your answer to that question and to all of your, um, all of the, um, all of the questions and comments, but also for the paper um, uh, as a whole, uh, which I think it's been remarkable listening to you as you sort of open up, evoke, and analyze and lay out for us a whole range of intellectual and political choices that, uh, um, that Polish Jews were making as they were uh, confronting um, 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 a political world which was darkening, but, but, but darkening in ways that they understood um, as it were, as opposed to the ways in which we understood, uh, understand now. And I think that is um, a, a terrific uh, achievement. I know you said that you eschew any publicity for your book, but I think this is absolutely fantastic publicity for your book. I'm sure you will sell more copies as a result of this evening's um, talk and discussion. And I just want to, again, Thank you. Thank everyone um, who has attended this evening and um, uh, who has contributed uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the discussion. And um, I, I certainly uh, look forward uh, uh, not only to more from you, but also to more papers at the Institute with many syllables in their title, because clearly there's a direct relationship between the number of syllables and the quality of the fare that we're given. So thank you very much indeed, Ken. And thanks indeed to all of you for being here this evening and, uh, and for these wonderful questions.